to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. The open source seed movement keeps growing. We've got that story plus IMF again. But first, the CIA is unironically talking about election fraud. The head of Carl's Jr. and Hardee's is going to be Trump's labor secretary. And the World War III PR prelude in Syria just turned hot again. And the private central bank that prints idiocracy's fiat currency just raised interest rates for only the second time in a decade. In a policy statement just a few hours ago, as I come to you, the Fed announced it had raised its benchmark interest rate from 0.5 to 0.75, up a quarter point from the previous level set one year ago. The central bank announced the hike following a two-day meeting in Washington. It was widely expected. Fed officials said they would like to raise rates once more in 2016, but the December meeting was the final chance to do that. It also represents a significant shift in how the Fed has operated since the financial crisis. And as soon as that happened and Yellen gave a press conference, the U.S. markets tanked. So, James, did you actually just wake up to this story on your side? Absolutely. Yes, I did. And I don't think it's particularly surprising. A lot of people were calling that there's, this was going to be a rate hike because they had to preserve Fed credibility. They said they were going to hike again in this year. So they this is the last chance. They had to do it. Right. And of course, the reason is because, well, markets are fine. Employment is stable and rising. We don't need much more fiscal tampering to to uh, to prime the uh, the markets anymore. So let's let's start taking the training wheels off this bike. That's the official story. Now, of course, what this is really about is uh, really draining the uh, draining the, the the swamp of free money bubble that they've created over the past decade of uh, basically free money that the the Fed has been giving out to financial institutions and making that uh, that spigot of liquidity just flow flowing, flowing, flowing. And now they're they're really starting to tighten it. Why precisely now? Why precisely now? Why after all of this time are they doing it now? Is it really because the economy is going along tickety-boo and everything's good? Or is it, as I was positing earlier this year, the Fed has a large degree of control over things like the selection process and the uh, the appearance of who's in control of the economy and, and which way it's going? Um, this is clearly, as we already see from the early market indications, not a good signal for the economy, which is at this point just completely primed and and uh, pumped by this this bubble that they've created. So when you start suddenly deflating the bubble, uh, it's going to cause problems. And this is the inevitable result. This is the the absolutely perfectly predictable result of this action, except for (laughs) Deutsche Bank, which I noticed was saying that no matter what the Fed did, whether they hiked or stayed the same or cut, it would all be good for the uh, the markets. (laughs) And they were wrong about that, weren't they? But no, this is is the inevitable result. So I'm just interested in the timing of this. Um, Of course, just as the changeover to the next puppet is taking place in the U.S., very interesting. But I think really the real show for me, I think, is going to be in the developing markets where all of that money has gone out to seek some sort of returns. All of that U.S. dollar um, denominated currency is going to be flowing back into the U.S. as they, they continue to hike rates. So I think we're going to see a lot of the uh, uh, real turmoil in um, emerging markets and places like India where the rupee has already been uh, hitting record lows um, at just on the anticipation of this move. So I think there's going to be a lot of reaction in that that we're, I'm not going to say looking forward to, but that we're going to be expecting um, coming in the next uh, month or two. And again, I think it's interesting the timing in all of this and the way they're trying to undo what they've done with the, the Obama splurge that they've uh, created, the big bubble, the Obama bubble, is now being popped just as Obama's leaving office and they're changing the, bird ca- the birdcage liner. Well, and I think we we spent a good part of 2016 on these New World Next Week episodes talking about Janet Yellen, talking about Trump, talking about Jamie Dimon, and all those kind of moves being made, I think, kind of ahead of the game. I've been talking on my morning show a lot about all the little sort of mergers and acquisitions happening in all kinds of industries, media and banking and all of it. And everybody's kind of getting their, their ducks in a row, so to speak. James, the other little bit of bad news I've got for you, you can't use the term swamp anymore. That's That's been co-opted to mean something else now. <laughs> Our second story on this New World Next Week, episode 293 for December 15th. IMF Chief Lagarde on trial in Paris over negligence charges. 
International Monetary Fund head Christine Lagarde has appeared before court this past Monday in Paris facing negligence charges over allowing a handout of $425 billion to a French tycoon while being the country's finance minister in 2008. Lagarde was described by the Associated Press as being poised and serious as she went on trial at the Court of Justice of the Republic intended for proceedings against government ministers and employees. According to Lagarde, she's taken time off from her day job as the managing director at the International Monetary Fund to face trial. Back in 2008, Lagarde, as a French finance minister, approved a handout of 403 million euros, that's that 425 million fiat American dollars, to tycoon Bernard Tapie in an arbitration deal in 2008 over the sale of Adidas sportswear makers. Air North American headquarters is pretty much in my, my backyard here in Portland, Oregon. The trial and a potential storm, or a rather potential uh, prison term, rather, may put Lagarde's future as IMF chief in question. She's just managing director. She might be too tainted now to become the actual head of the IMF. Her predecessor, another Frenchman, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, was forced to resign in 2011 amid allegations of sexual assaults. And we've got a New World Next Week episode where we called it IMF, Lagarde Under Investigation in France. That goes back over two years ago into August of 2014. So I was curious about the managing director before the Wrath of Khan, so I hit up Wikipedia and found that it's Rodrigo Rato. He was arrested for alleged fraud, embezzlement, and money laundering. His case was still awaiting trial when his name then showed up in the Panama Papers. So that's not the only action against decades-old corruption as the wheels of justice are quite squeaky. Bush war crimes lawsuit gets heard in a California court. Now, James, that's lots of cronies going up for crimes, and we'll see if anything happens in any of these situations, James. What a glorious parade that would be, wouldn't it, as Bush and Cheney and Wolfowitz and Pearl and all the neocons are perp-walked into the gallows after having been committed of their war crimes in Iraq. And who would be more happy to see such a sight than myself? Probably no one. Now allow me to rain on that parade. Uh, this is not a criminal trial, of course. It is a tort action. It is civil law. So basically a lawsuit. And at this point, the court is really just hearing oral arguments as to whether or not immunity applies to these federal officials because they were acting in the, the capacity of their jobs. They were acting within their, their scope of office. Therefore, they are uh, protected by uh, legislation that's been passed by the Congress to give um, grant immunity to federal officials, like Christine Todd Whitman, for example, has been granted immunity for her killing of people at Ground Zero because, well, she was doing doing her job. Um, so uh, I did watch the oral arguments. I'll put them on uh, in the show notes. They're on YouTube. You can go watch them. I gotta say. <laughs> It doesn't look that great at this point. The judge is clearly questioning why on earth they should even be listening to this uh, trial because it seems quite clear cut to them that these people were acting within their scope of office. So you can't really su sue them for it. Um, so a lot of reasons that this parade uh, is being rained on, and I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but they're probably, I mean, this isn't going to end up in any sort of criminal action, so they're not going to end up in jail or anything of the sort. And it looks like the lawsuit may not even proceed. So all that being said, if you do want more information on that and some other actions that are going on right now, uh, I will refer people back to a GRTV report that I did a month or two ago called Justice for Neocons. Uh, lawsuits challenge American status quo, where I have more about this case, the Salavi Bush case, as well as the case uh, against the DNC, the class action lawsuit that's being waged against them for rigging the uh, primaries. James, did you also recently just put up an article? I was, I was furiously taking notes there. Did you put up an article about the case against Kissinger recently as well? Yes, because there just last weekend there was a, uh, a Nobel Peace Prize forum put on by the Nobel Committee in Oslo uh, where they invited Kissinger and Brzezinski to talk about the United States and world peace. <sighs> what do you even say about that? <laughs> He's saying hashtag not the onion. Our third and final story this week is a long story that has a lot of information, and we'll include a link to that in the show notes, just like we include links to everything that we mention on these episodes down in the show notes. 
So the long version is open source seed producers are changing global food production. And it comes from a website called Insea, where they note around the world, plant breeders are resisting what they see as corporate control of the food supply by making seeds available for other breeders to use. Now, that's the longer version. The short version, it somewhat, I guess, reads a little bit like a press release, but it's the way to sort of get this information across. And it's a very simple idea. Free the seed. Inspired by the free and open source software movement that provides alternatives to proprietary software, the Open Source Seed Initiative, OSSI, was created to free the seed to make sure that genes and at least some seeds can never be locked away from use by intellectual property rights. In other words, open source varieties and any varieties bred from them are a part of a protected public commons free for all to grow and breed as they see fit. Since so many varieties nowadays are being patented and otherwise protected by intellectual property rights, removing them from the pool of breeding stock, open source seed has become a critical tool for ensuring that public plant breeders have the genetic resources to continue developing new varieties. There's a bunch more information at osseeds.org, but suffice it to say, from U.S. to India, the open source revolution rages on. James? And let's hope it continues to, uh, not just continues to rage on, but gets caught and uh, picked up and, and really pushed, because it is so important that we preserve the <laughs> preserve the liberty that we have now, um, and it is dwindling. And I hope people will go and read that full article, because it does give a good sense of what's at stake here, um, talking to people who are trying to breed a new varieties of lettuce, for example, and are prevented in doing so, because it's not just certain types or strains or of, of lettuce it's it's qualities of the lettuce that you can have the certain curliness and things like this are patented patented so that you cannot create new varieties that do that without breaking a patent absolutely ridiculous and of course uh, as i'm sure my longtime listeners will know this goes back to diamond v chakrabarty back in 1980 or 81 and the the initial uh, Supreme Court granting of patents for life, uh, patenting life itself. Hey, why not? What could possibly go wrong? Well, here we are, and it's only going to get worse from here unless people really do understand the uh, absolute incredible urgency of this matter and the fact that the open seed revolution is important. If people want more information on this, I did a, a GRTV video, I believe, four years ago now, Open Seeds, Biopiracy, and the Patenting of Life, that I'll refer people back to. An incredibly important issue, and I hope people look into it. I, I attended a conference a few years ago, uh, Seeds for Sovereignty, and it was basically I heard the same thing there that I heard and read in one of these articles. You can't have food sovereignty unless you have seed sovereignty. So, James, I actually it makes it that much more important. I was I was talking this morning that the Monsanto shareholders have given the go ahead for the big sixty six billion dollar Monsanto Bayer merger. So, the open source seed initiative becomes that much more important. A little bit of extra good news is the latest episode of Good News Next Week, my spinoff from this New World Next Week series that I started early this year in 2016 to try and highlight some of the ways that we are winning. It's called We Go Where Eagles Dare, and it's got eagles versus drones, plus freed cats and freed whistleblowers. Some of the other headlines we're watching using hashtag New World Next Week, pipeline spills 176,000 gallons of crude. That's 150 miles from the Dakota protest camp. And from the Department of Why Didn't We Think of This Sooner, UK MPs claim Russian hackers probably swayed the Brexit vote. And finally, Bill Gates says Donald Trump could be the new John F. Kennedy. So as we're watching all the coded language from the powers that shouldn't be, we will be back next week with our final episode for 2016. We call it New World Next Year 2017. We each pick our story of the past year and a trend for the next year. It's the only episode of the year where neither of us know what the other is going to talk about. James? Well, get your tie ready, and uh, we'll we'll get our game on. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again next week. James, thank you for this update. Thanks so much, man. Take care.